again, building bands, awesome. You heard me talk about it. Um, I'll kind of sit on this slide here really quick. Um, so again, those are our stocks with the little mini lift um, to lift the minis up. Um, and then we work out of a stall as well as our portable stocks there in the bottom right. So getting into the history of dentistry, I'm just gonna double check. Everybody can see this history of dentistry slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. So in 750 BC was the evidence of the first wolf tooth extraction in a Mongolian horse. Um, 600 BC, there's Chinese literature that talks about aging horses by their teeth. Um, and then all through the World War I, um, when horses were in Calvary were really important, um, there was actually military veterinarians who would work on horses' teeth. Um, but kind of recently within the last 15-ish years, there's really been a lot of significant advancements made in the equine dentistry practice, which is kind of where we are now today. So the modern equine dentistry, uh, we've adapted a five-component oral exam, um, which is what we implement in our practice here and what we teach um, other veterinarians who come and do continued education classes with us, as well as when we go into the universities and teach there. Um, we talk about the occlusal adjustment, which is the floating of the teeth. Um, but really the priority now is more on preventative medicine versus treatment. So doing yearly exams, really trying to pinpoint diseases before they become significant and trying to um, reduce pathology and things like that. Um, I'm just gonna touch very quickly on advanced diagnostics. There's only three slides on it. Um, Cause the majority of this presentation is gonna be about the oral exam and then the floating. Um, so the oroscope is just a little camera that we can put in the mouth. Um, we can take really nice pictures as well as videos. Um, this really helps with client education as well as we take a lot of these images and put them in our dental chart. Um, and sometimes it's in the very back of the mouth since the teeth go all the way back to behind the eye. Um, it gets really difficult to see back there if they have a lot of things going on. So being able to get a nice up close look um, the image here on the left, that's actually a prosthetic tooth that we've built to protect uh, an oral sinus fistula. Um, this is when on a recheck, so she's actually fractured it on the front here and a little piece off there. So we actually pulled it and replaced it. Um, the image on the right is showing a really large distal ramp. Um, and so just kind of different pathology. Uh, so radiographs, this is kind of our key bread and butter of diagnostics that we use here in our practice. We have portable machines that we have on every rig. Um, this gives us a really great look of everything below the gum line. So we only see about maybe a centimeter of the tooth in the mouth. And then you have another, depending on how old the horse is, up to four inches below the gum line. So being able to get a really good look at that is something that is really important. So this is actually an example of a tooth that has a big abscess or an infection down at the apex of it, which has resulted in a bony swelling here. So that tooth would be extracted. And then CT has become really large in dentistry as well. Um, a lot of the, the sinus cases that we see, we refer to, to uh, have a CT done, uh, mostly to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, this is more of a 3D rendering of a bunch of radiographs put together. Um, so we can do reconstructions, we can look at different angles. Um, so it really, really gives us a lot more images and information than just a plain radiograph. This is an example of what's called an ear tooth. So every once in a while, um, You'll, they'll form a little dental structure near the base of the ear. And we have to be really careful when we go to remove those because sometimes they do go into the brain, um, which those are obviously unfortunate procedures that we can't do with surgery because um, you don't want to risk going into the brain vault itself. So why do we float teeth? Horses have teeth that continue to erupt into their mouth as they age. So the picture over to the right is a great example. So this is a young, fully formed tooth in a six-year-old quarter horse that's about five inches long. And then this is an example of a horse from a 26-year-old. Um, so as they erupt into the mouth, the chewing action wears the, the tooth away. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about the mastication and the, the chewing mechanisms in the next slide. Um, but that, that wearing away of that chewing surface is what creates those sharp enamel points. So when we float them, we're addressing those sharp points as well as any malocclusions or 
uh, abnorm abnormalities that they may have in the mouth. So the mechanics of chewing. So horses are agnesognathic, which means that the lower jaw is set narrower than the upper jaw. So this gives the teeth a little bit of an angle. Um, and then they chew in a side to side circular manner, which that essentially causes the sharp points. Um, when their head is lowered, it, the, that lower jaw slides back. And then when they raise their head, that lower jaw slides forward. So this side to side and sliding forward and back motion all needs to be taken into consideration when we're making adjustments during our float. So the biggest question that we get is how come wild horses don't need their teeth floated? And there's kind of a three to four main reasons why and kind of the first and second reason go together. So they have a much more abrasive diet. They're out foraging, um, wandering across long plains and prairies. A lot of times they're eating shrubs and, and kind of scrubby grass and things like that. So they're not eating the nice, soft, green, lush grass that we have in our pastures or the beautiful hay that we grow for them. Uh, they also have a shorter lifespan. So they don't live to be quite as long as our domestic species, uh, our domesticated horses that we keep at home. So they don't necessarily uh, need all the care that, that we give them, um, but the, the care that we do give our domesticated horses enables them to live longer. So we're able to take care of any abnormalities or make considerations if their their teeth are wearing out or if they're not doing as well, we can uh, address it accordingly. But then also the biggest factor is natural selection. So in captivity, we breed for athletic performance or color or body conformation and things like that versus in the wild, all they have to do is be able to survive. So horses that have a better anatomy that makes them uh, more hardy are the ones that pass on their genetics. So this is actually an image that I'm sure a lot of you have seen. It was floating around last year on Facebook from Galisto Basin Veterinary Service. This is a skull that was found in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, but there is evidence of significant dental disease that has caused bone loss. So obviously, I just wanted to include this to show that wild horses aren't immune to dental disease. They also get it as well. It just unfortunately sometimes costs them their lives. But let's get into the teeth themselves. How many teeth do horses have? Uh, so it, this is a little bit easier when you're in a lecture and you can wait for people to answer the question, but um, they have anywhere from 36 to 44. So if they have every tooth that they should have, they'll have 44. Um, and the variation comes in whether or not they have the canines and the wolf teeth here, which we'll get into briefly. So each, we, we number and name the teeth based on the quadrant. So there's four quadrants in the mouth, upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. And within that quadrant, there's three incisors, which is the very front teeth here that they use to nip the short grass um, or bite their friends or lack thereof. Um, these canines here, those are your fighting teeth. So that's potentially uh, a tooth that may not be there in every horse. All male teeth or male horses, so geldings and stallions have those large canines. Mares on the other hand may or may not have them. And if they do have them, they tend to be significantly smaller. Uh, sometimes they're under the, the gingiva or the gum still, so we can feel them, but we don't necessarily see them. Um, and then the next tooth is this tiny little tooth here. That's the first premolar and also known as the wolf tooth. This is uh, what we call a vestigial tooth, so it's not a chewing tooth or really any reason for it in the modern horse. Um, a lot of times these teeth are extracted uh, in a young horse prior to going into training because it potentially could cause some issues with the bit. Um, a lot of times this first peak tooth or the second premolar, when the cap or the baby tooth over it sheds, it'll take that wolf tooth with it. Um, and some horses just don't get them at all. But more commonly, we'll see them on the top than on the bottom, but every once in a while, we'll see them in all four places. And then the rest of the teeth here are the cheek teeth. So that's the remaining premolars and your molars. So there's six of those cheek teeth in each quadrant. And so those are your big heavy hitters. Those are the ones that they use to grind up all their forage. So again, there's 12 incisors. So those are the teeth in the front. And then the ones here on the side, those are the canines. There's four canines. And then this is a quite a large wolf tooth here. And then here's a tiny little one. So they range in size and mobility. So the ones that are really mobile and really tiny, those are the ones that we always extract because those ones tend to interfere with the bit and the bridle. Um, and sometimes you'll feel them under the tissue where they haven't quite erupted. 
So those are also the ones that we, we take out because those ones tend to be very irritating, having the bit rub on those. And then the cheek teeth here. So just touching briefly on deciduous or baby teeth, these are also known as caps. Uh, they have three caps that are either in the mouth when they're born or they come in slightly after. So they have them within the first week of life. Um, and then this is the first molar. So this is the first adult tooth that comes into their mouth. They get that one when they're about a year old. The second molar comes when they're about two. And then this last molar, uh, that one comes between three and a half to, to four. Um, and then they shed these caps at a designated period of time. And then they also have baby teeth in the front. So the incisors and the premolars all have deciduous or baby teeth. So we take, talk about floating, which is great. Um, but the reason why we want to sedate them and float them is so that we can get a good oral exam, because that is actually the most important part of why we want to see your horse every year. And the reason we want to do that is for good preventative dentistry. So we want to make sure we can identify endodontic and periodontal disease early on. So we're going to talk about both of those shortly. Um, but catching those disease processes early allow us to do a little bit more of a conservative therapy versus having to jump right to tooth extraction. Because once those disease processes get significant enough, the only option we really have is to pull the tooth. So I have a couple of examples here on as to why to do a good oral exam. So this tooth or this horse here has obviously been floated. There's no sharp points here. It actually has a nice balance or um, there's no high teeth or anything like that. Um, so what we would say this horse is actually an, an adequate balance. And if you were just to pull a tongue out the side and just peek, you would say, oh, yep, that horse is great. We don't have to do anything. But once you sedate them and get your mirror back here, so the tongue is sitting here on the left side of the picture. Once you get your mirror back there, there's this area where he was packing quite a bit of food and it caused the, what we call a periodontal pocket. And that leads to bone loss. And then that tooth there is actually in trouble. So this is the same horse here. So this picture here is the same radiograph here. And so catching those findings, if we were to caught that early on, we could have done some conservative treatment and been able to save that tooth. Unfortunately, now this tooth is compromised and will have to be extracted. So another reason is, this is another example, this horse was lame um, when being ridden um, and they couldn't find the source of the lameness so they ended up finally getting to the mouth and he actually had a very painful mouth. So he had infundibular cavities, which again we'll talk about shortly, that was causing significant pain and trauma um, and two of those teeth had actually fractured. And so he needed extraction of those two fractured teeth as well as some restorations of those cavities. And once all of his procedures were taken care of and he was healed up, he went right back to work with no lameness issues. So let's get into the oral exam itself, since that's the most important part as to why we want to see your horse. So we adapted a five component exam. So we do an external exam, soft tissues, occlusal uh, exam, as well as the checking the periodontal and the endodontic status. So my mom is a dental hygienist, so she gets a kick out of our instruments because they're just super sized versions of what she uses at her office. So we have a dental mirror so that we can see every inch of that mouth, as well as, as a periodontal probe to measure any depths or sulci and things like that. And then we have an explorer, as well as a various arrangement of some picks and forceps to be able to pick some food and things like that in between those teeth. So starting with the external exam, we want to make sure your horse has a nice symmetric head, that all the muscles that they use for chewing um, are symmetrical and he doesn't have any muscle loss or anything like that. We want to make sure the head is symmetrical. This horse here on the right is actually what we call a wry nose. So his skull actually twists off to the right here which then impacts the way his dentition is. Um, but those are kind of some things that we look at in for confirmation speaking. Um, we also look for any swellings, uh, draining tracts, um, anything that may be painful on the head. Like this is a, a bony swelling here with a little draining tract out the bottom. And so those all kind of key us in before we even open the mouth that there may be some dental problems that we need to really take a close look at. Then we assess the soft tissues. So that is the, the tongue, the cheeks, the roof of the mouth, um, everything along those lines. So here are some abrasions. This is the most common thing we see. Um, these result from the sharp points that develop when the horse is chewing. Um, so once we float this mouth, um, in a couple of days, those will be healed up. So the, the tissue of the mouth is wonderful. It heals very quickly. 
so again, this is actually likely from a, a bit pinch. Um, so we check for these things as well. Um, if we notice things like that, we may ask you to grab your bridle so we can just check the fit to make sure that the, the bit isn't too narrow or there's nothing pinching on those um, pieces of, that we put along the mouth. Here's another large abrasion in the back. That was from a sharp point that was sticking off the back of the, the tooth. Every once in a while, we'll get big erosions like this if they have feed that gets stuck there that they're not cycling through, and then that food just wears away into the cheek. And those things can all be quite irritating. So there are some issues that we run into as well um, that have nothing to do with the teeth. So this horse actually got into some caustic weeds. Um, so he had some sloughing of the tongue here. Uh, he was salivating profusely, which is why we were called out to do an exam. Um, but we find little things like this, as well as looking for any masses or tumors, which unfortunately this is an example of squamous cell carcinoma. So again, this horse was one that wasn't eating quite as vigorously as he normally had been. Um, the owner noticed he had been drooling a little bit more than normal. Um, and so when we got in there to an exam, he actually had quite a bit of, of erosion and recession here from the, the tumor, as well as some attachment loss on these last two teeth. And those teeth were quite mobile. Um, and so we took some samples here to submit for pathology, um, but, but things like that, unfortunately this significant, um, this horse was just humanely euthanized because that was a very, very significant lesion that was really impacting his quality of life. So moving to occlusion, so that's how the teeth line up. Um, these are some examples of incisors. So the incisor on the left is perfect occlusion. We want them to line up nice like that. Um, the one on the right is an example of what we call a malocclusion two or an overbite or a parrot mouth. Um, the malocclusion two is probably the most common malocclusion we see. Um, most horses don't have it to this significant degree, but a lot of the times they'll have at least a slight overbite, which results in some, some hooks and ramps that we have to address in the back of the mouth. Here's a very significant overbite. Um, so there's an example of that one. And then this is a, a class three malocclusion or an underbite or a monkey mouth. Um, this is more common in the minis. Uh, some ponies tend to have the, um, an underbite like this, but this is a pretty significant one. Uh, sometimes when they have a really significant underbite like this, we have to remove the upper incisors because it causes some trauma here. Um, but they really don't need their incisors besides biting short, short grass, which this horse obviously cannot do that anyway because those don't even line up. So removing that trauma can also improve their comfort. And then we get individual tooth uh, malposition. So you can see this tooth here on the upper left, uh, that tooth is pushed over into the palate so that tooth erupted into the mouth and not in the appropriate spot. It's gotten quite over long and can cause trauma to the tongue and other tissues. Um, and so the reason why they get so over long like that is because they're out of line and they're not rubbing against anything. So the way that the mouth is designed is that these upper cheek teeth should overlay these lower cheek teeth perfectly. So when they chew, they wear each other away so that they are worn at the same period. And when you don't get that, you get these overgrowths. So there's nothing wearing away on this tooth. So that's where we come in, where we really address all those overlengths and making sure nothing gets out of hand. And since nothing is rubbing away on that, that's what we would float down. So we do the, the mechanical action of removing that tooth for the horse. And so this is another horse with unfortunately what we call summer teeth. Some teeth are over here, some teeth are over there. Um, this is poor anatomy that really predisposes this horse to periodontal disease, um, which is uh, um, spaces that get food stuck in it and, and things like that, um, which we'll talk about in the next slide. This is the radiograph of that horse. Um, so the bone should be at this red line here and where the arrows are is where the bone is. Um, so that's quite a bit of bone loss from that periodontal disease, um, which is secondary to that poor anatomy. So getting into periodontal disease, peri the periodontia is everything that essentially holds the, the tooth in the head. So you have your gingiva or your gums, and then the periodontal ligament, which is that Velcro that, that holds the tooth in the socket. And then the cementum, which is the, the tooth structure on the tooth itself that the periodontal ligament attaches to and then the alveolar bone, which is the bone that surrounds the tooth. 
So diagnosing periodontal disease, we, we stage it with different stages, and that depends on the degree of bone loss and the irritation that is present. Um, we have to do all that with radiographs. So here is a short video with a horse with some pretty significant periodontal disease. Let me turn the bottom here. So these spaces in between here, where this food is getting stuck, that's called diastema. Um, so getting that food stuck there is irritating to the tissues. And once we get inflammation of those tissues, that chronic inflammation results in bone loss. And you can see that there's quite a bit of tongue irritation from rubbing against that feed material um, in spaces like along those lines. So this horse has actually pretty severe problems on the other side compared to this side. He's not nearly as bad. So his alignment here, a little bit off here, um, but this side is a little bit better than the other side. When you get towards the back of the mouth, it does get a little more severe. Again, really significant abrasions in the cheeks and tongue there. So that's where we come in with our periodontal probe after we get all those spaces cleaned out so we can really assess them. This periodontal probe is about 30 centimeters long. Uh, a normal probing depth and a, a healthy attachment on a tooth is about three. So this is an example of a pocket here. You can see the gingival recession and that probe just sunk right down in there. So that is 10 times what it should normally be. So when we find things like that, we have to take radiographs to assess the tooth health. So this tooth had a big lucency below it. It has some resorption and some inflammation going on the roots. So that tooth's in trouble and it needs to be extracted. So again, assessing the bone height is key um, and all the treatments that we'll talk about here in the next slide are, are reasons and ways to prevent this bone loss. Because as soon as we lose the bone, we can't ever get that back. So preventing that bone loss is key in treatment of periodontal disease. So some of the treatments, um, we always do an occlusal adjustment. Um, a lot of those overlong points act as a bit of a wedge and that, that causes those spaces to form and make them worse and, and moves the teeth around. Um, so we always wanna make sure that they have adequate balance and there's, there's no malocclusions that can be uh, causing or making these periodontal problems worse. We also may recommend some dietary management changes. So really stemmy hay gets really stuck in there. Um, if you think about when you're eating popcorn and if you hit a, one of those really tough husks that jams in between those teeth and that can be really irritating versus if you're eating pieces that are um, free of those husks, those are nice and soft and we don't have any problems. So a lot of these horses we may recommend either a pelleted diet or a soft diet at least until we can get the periodontal disease under hand. Um, and, and going along things like that. So some more advanced options, um, we do a periodontal debridement. So this is similar to a water pick. So this is pressurized water that we use to spray in between the teeth to clean out those pockets. Um, you can see a lot of gingival recession there and irritation, that's from that food sitting there. This site here isn't nearly as advanced, so the, the space isn't quite as wide, but you can see after the spray is done spraying, um, that tissue is, is still pink and at the level that it should be maybe slightly recessed compared to this one, which is really red and irritated. Then we also have diastema packing, which I'll show you here briefly, diastema widening and occlusal relief cutting. Oops. So the packing, um, we use this in spaces that tend to be a little bit wider. Um, so it's a foldable impression material that is used in humans to make dental impressions. Um, so we have a little gun that we, we put back in that space and we put that flowable material in there that kind of sets up to a firm rubber. So that acts as a spacer or a plug to keep the food from getting stuck in there. And that keeps for the, the tissues from becoming more irritated. Now, depending on the space shape, um, we may do what's called a diastema widening. So this diastema here on the left end of the screen is what we call a valve diastema. It's V-shaped where it has a tighter space at the chewing surface compared to the gum surface. So food really gets stuck in there and then it has a hard time getting out. So what we do is we take a little burr that we, we shape this and make these walls straighter. So that lets the food cycle through. So sometimes that in itself is enough of a treatment to, to help heal that area. But a lot of times once we do that widening, then we'll use our impression material to fill that in just to protect these, these tissues here and make sure that they uh, heal and, and don't continuously get irritated by feed getting stuck in there. 
So some of our spaces aren't nearly quite as significant. So this is where we want to catch them. So we want to catch these spaces when they're just starting to get some feed trapping, maybe a little bit of gingival irritation, but the, the teeth are still pretty nice and tight. Um, we can do a procedure called a occlusal relief cut, where we essentially make this tiny little groove in between those teeth at the chewing surface. That little groove makes a channel that lets the food cycle through instead of getting stuck and packed in between those teeth. So here's an example, um, it's I believe this verse here. So there was some feed packing and recession. So you can see the recession here. We made that little occlusal cut. So the, the pocket depth with our periodontal probe was eight millimeters at the time that we found it and made the cut. Uh, did a recheck in three months, that gingival tissue had healed over. It was nice and pink. Um, the probing depth was five millimeters. And then in another three months after that, that probing depth went right back to normal. So a lot of times when we catch those early, we can actually address it. And as the, the tooth erupts in, it becomes healthy again. So catching those things early before they have those significant bone loss, that's, that's the key of why we want to do these exams. So moving on to the last part of our oral exam, it's the endodontic status or the endodontic components of the tooth. So when we talked about periodontal status, that's everything around the tooth. Endodontic is everything of the tooth and within the tooth. So the pulp is the vital part of the tooth. That's where the nerve and the blood supply lives. Uh, this is the young tooth that was extracted. Um, and this is the live pulp, this kind of octopus looking thing that was plucked out of the, the pulp chamber. Um, each of these fibers runs in a pulp chamber that runs down to the chewing surface of the tooth. And then the dental structures are the non-vital part of the tooth, which is dentin, enamel, and cementum. Those are all included in the endodontic disease category. So here's a little diagram of inside the tooth. Uh, so this is the chewing surface here. These dark dashes here is where that pulp lives. Um, so you can see the pulp is this pink structure that there's a substance called secondary dentin that keeps getting laid down as the tooth erupts into the mouth to protect that. Um, so we wanna make sure that each of those popcorns has that nice healthy covering of that dentin. This is also why we have to take really consideration when we're reducing any overlong teeth. Um, we'll be reducing it and we stop and check it frequently to make sure that we're not getting too close to exposing the pulp because we don't want to cause any problems by reducing any of those overgrowth. So a lot of times we, we may have to stage any significant reductions. On the upper cheek teeth, they also have this structure called infundibula, which is an enamel rimmed cup. And that's the, pro the purpose of that, we believe, is just to increase surface area and allow um, uh, for some greater uh, forces when you masticate and some grinding ability with having that extra enamel rim there because the enamel is the hardest part of the tooth. So this is just a tooth that was cut through one of those pulp chambers. So again here you can see that thin little dentin cap followed by where the sensitive part of the tooth lives. And then here's that infundibula here. So we're going to talk about pulp exposure very briefly. So when we have pulp exposure, that usually means that there's been some sort of trauma to that tooth or that tooth has become compromised and it can't produce that secondary dentin anymore. Uh, sometimes they'll have just one pulp that's exposed. Other times it's more significant like this tooth has all of its pulps exposed as well as a fracture through here. Um, so that tooth is dead and is not laying down any of that protective substance. And so that tooth um, is allowing bacteria and feed to get packed into those pulp chambers, which then runs all the way up to the root of the tooth and then can cause a big infection there. Um, on the upper teeth, we get really concerned about that, especially in the molars, because it li lives right below the sinus. And so having a tooth infection there may cause a sinus infection, um, and that leads to bigger problems. And nobody likes a stinky, smelly nose with, with uh, pus coming out of it. Um, on the lower teeth, uh, it can cause abscesses where they get those big swellings as well as draining tracts and things like that. But all those um, can be quite uncomfortable for the horse. So when we find teeth like that, unfortunately, um, the only treatment option is to extract the tooth. Getting in some fractures. So this is kind of a, a minor fracture here. Um, so when we see things like that, again, we have to take radiographs because you know, it kind of doesn't look too bad. It's only a little piece of the tooth there. But when we take a radiograph, here's that same radiograph, and we're going to blow up on that tooth here. So this is the tooth with the fracture. 
and there is some blunting of that root with some infection starting around it. So that tooth's in trouble and is going to need to come out um, before it causes bigger problems. Um, unfortunately, sometimes if we leave these teeth, uh, again, they can cause a sinus infection. Sometimes the it causes resorption and inflammation of the teeth next to it. Um, so catching these things early so we can address it and remove just one tooth instead of having to do um, a more significant procedure. So here's a more significant fracture. So this tooth was fractured um, and pushed off into the cheek here, which can cause cheek abrasions and can be very uncomfortable, um, especially if they poke into the tongue. Um, horses will eat through broken jaws and things like that, but as soon as they have something poking into their tongue, they don't like that. Um, Here's a radiograph of that. So you can see that that tooth has been fractured for a really long time. It has quite a bit of root resorption. It should have these nice long spindle-like roots here, but instead it's this kind of just a blob of tissue here. Um, so getting that out before it causes more problems. Um, teeth like that are more prone to getting periodontal disease around it because they are trapping food and things like that. So all sources of discomfort for our horse. So moving to infundibular caries. So this is um, addressing that structure of the infundibula, so that little cup in the maxillary teeth. So these structures are only present in the upper teeth. So these are teeth that have cavities in them, so they should be filled with a nice creamy yellow sub substance with a little dot in the middle and not be packed with food. When we see food in there, that's when we start classifying the cavities. Excuse me. And based on what structures and how significant that cavity is, is we, we grade those. So based on what grade they are, is kind of gives us options on what type of treatment we're gonna do. So this one here is an early stage, or this is closer to a stage one cavity, hasn't quite gotten to the enamel rim here, versus this is a more advanced cavity in the mesial and distal infundibula here that is causing more disease. Um, so why do those cavities form? So this infundibular structure here is filled with cementum, and only 11% of the horse population has perfect filled infundibula where they're not going to have any problems with it whatsoever. The rest of the population have these little defects or voids at the apex of those infundibula. And as that tooth gets weared away, that void becomes exposed to the chewing surface, and that lets food and bacteria get packed into those voids, and then when that food material gets stuck in there, it starts to decompose, which then causes the, um, sorry, I'm having a brain fart, causes the erosion of the structures around it. So balancing between how significant the cavity and the erosion is with how much tooth is left is when we recommend uh, different treatment options. So a lot of them, if they're an older horse, um, they're kind of getting towards the end and the, the cavity isn't quite so severe, uh, we usually recommend just monitoring those. Um, the ones that we recommend addressing or causing or cleaning out and filling, like a restoration, are the ones that we may note uh, to be an early stage one or stage two, and then we come back the following year and they've advanced significantly. Um, those ones are the ones that we're more concerned about. Uh, reason why we get concerned is when both of these defects are present or if one is significantly um, eroding around the tooth, that causes instability of that tooth and that tooth becomes more prone to fracture. And once the tooth fractures, that has to be extracted. So here's an example of a horse that had restorations put in. Uh, here is um, a restoration that we put in on a horse that was a 15-year-old paint um, that was previously uh, seen for a fractured of the exact same tooth but on the opposite side. So you can see that there's a hole here. So that was where the tooth was extracted. Um, and it was based on, or the tooth fractured because it had cavities and it split right down the middle. Um, so in order to prevent the same fate for this tooth, uh, the owner elected to let us do a restoration. So what we do is we clean out that, that canal there in that chamber. So here's it all cleaned out of the feed material and debrided, and then we fill it with the same composite that the dentists use to make crowns. And then we can see it here on the radiograph. So we have that chamber nice and filled. So the reason why we want to fill that is so that we can halt that decay process and, and try to increase the stability and, and reduce the risk of fracture of the, that tooth. So here's an example of very severe cavities that has resulted in fracture. So unfortunately, when we get to this point, the only treatment option that we have is extracting that tooth. 
So here's a, we'll just watch a little bit of this video. This is a video showing a bunch of different cavities. So there's food stuck. So when we get in here and we look at the mouth, we're looking for feed being stuck. Um, so here's another cavity here. Here's another cavity here. These are all pretty early stage one cavities. So these ones we would just, just monitor. Here's a little bit more of an advanced cavity. It's got staining of the rest of the tooth. And then back to kind of more of a stage two cavity. So those ones we usually recommend watching unless, like I said, they advance pretty significantly. Stage three cavities are the ones that we recommend restor restoring. So I'm going to just touch very briefly on equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hypercementosis, um, which is a mouthful, but it, we shorten it to EOTRH. Um, this is probably one of the most common disease processes that we diagnose in horses over the age of 15 um, and probably the most common surgical procedure that we do here in the practice. So EOTRH is a progressive inflammatory disease process. Uh, it usually infects um, incisors and canines. Um, every once in a while we'll see it in the cheek teeth, but primarily these teeth in the front of the mouth are the ones that are affected. Um, some of them may develop hypersmentosis. So these moth-eaten lesions here, that's the resorptive process. And then when they get these really big bulbous roots on it, that's the hypersmentosis part of the disease process. These teeth become quite painful. They can become infected and they get loose and are more, they, they're weakened because of all this resorption. So they may fracture and things like that. Um, again, it's most commonly affecting horses over the age of 15. Um, and so the, the biggest thing is that we have to diagnose it with radiographs. So every once in a while, um, you'll see a horse that has beautiful incisors and you take a radiograph and they have pretty significant lesions. When we start seeing changes in the mouth, we know that the lesions are very significant. So we'll, we'll see these this kind of mottled or pebbly looking gingiva. Um, you might see little pimples or red dots. Um, and a lot of times, with, especially if they have the hypersmentosis, they kind of get this bulbous appearance here. Um, but this is a very advanced stage of, of EOTRH. And, and this is quite a, a painful disease process. So a lot of these horses, um, they may become head shy or, or more resistant to taking the bit. Um, sometimes they'll, they won't necessarily want to eat as much out of their uh, if you have a hay bag, they may struggle with that, or if you, they're turned out and they, they aren't necessarily grazing quite as much or quite as well as they used to. Um, we like to kind of give owners the carrot test. Horses that normally bite through the, the carrot, if you offer it to them and they, they're resistant to biting down and biting through that carrot, sometimes that is a, a, a sign that their incisors are quite painful. Um, sometimes you have just a very polite horse. Um, but the biggest thing is we usually recommend just screening them after they turn the age of 15. Um, so we might take some radiographs, be like, oh yeah, there may be some minor changes. Let's recheck it in the two or two years or so. Or maybe, like, oh no, he looks great. Let's recheck him in another three years um, where we take those radiographs periodically as they age, just so that we can catch these early. Because um, when they get into that sensitive part of the tooth there, that is quite painful. Um, and unfortunately, the only treatment we have for this is is extracting the affected teeth. So every once in a while we'll catch it early and you may, and it usually affects the corner incisors first. Um, so you take the teeth that are affected and then remain, leave the rest of them. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we finally are able to catch it and diagnose it, it's, it's usually affecting all of the incisors. So then we have to all take all the incisors out, which is usually shocking and concerning for a lot of owners because they are worried about how they're gonna eat, um, but they actually do quite well. So sorry if you get grossed out by pictures, um, but this is a horse that had uh, EOTRH significantly. Um, this is before we did the procedure on him. He's a 26-year-old thoroughbred. Um, this is 24 hours after the surgery. This was two weeks after the surgery, and then this is four weeks after the surgery. And then this is what he looked like six months after the procedure. So he really blossomed, and most owners tell us that they act 10 years younger after they get all those incisors out. Um, they really only need their incisors to, to bite people, or if you have like golf course length grass maybe, um, or a really tiny nibble net. But for the most part, they use their lips for everything. So when they sort through their pellets and they sort out their percent or those tiny little pellet or pills and things like that that are trying to sneak in their grain, um, and they sort through that and find it, that's all done with their lips. So their lips are very tactile. 
So what do we expect afterwards? So when we pull all those teeth, um, we recommend no bit work for two to four weeks to let all that heal. And then they can go right back to their job. A lot of these horses are performance horses that go right back to working. Um, they, Like I said, they use their lips um, for grazing and they, they learn how to use that. Some horses even learn how to go back to a feed bag. Um, they just struggle with the really tiny nibble nets. But if you have a, a the bigger hold feed bags or the ones with the holes in them um, or the big round hole, they can maneuver that just fine. Um, the only downside is their chong may protrude a little bit. Uh, that tends to be more of a temperament based. Uh, so if a horse is more uptight, we have one here that lives at the clinic, you'll you never see his tongue. Um, he always holds it in. He's, he's very uptight and persnickety that way versus if you have more of a relaxed horse that's laid back, uh, their ten may pursue, tongue may pursue, protrude a little bit, um, but they always tend to hold it back in when they're working. So, uh, But we have written a few doctor's excuses for horses that do dressage and things that say, um, please excuse the tongue if it sticks out a little bit. He doesn't have any incisors. So just dropping back to the, the occlusal adjustment and floating. Um, so when we float, we want to remove those sharp enamel points just to improve comfort of the soft tissue. But the biggest part is addressing any of those malocclusions or the, the overlong teeth or the excessive ridges that may form. So here's an example of some sharp points along here and some long ridges. And then after the float where they're nice and smoothed and balanced. Again here, this is a pretty significant overgrowth or we call that an excessive transverse ridge. Again, when we're reducing that, we want to make sure that we're not going to reduce it too far to get into that sensitive part of the tooth. So we may not be able to reduce it back totally and it might have to be a step-by-step -step, uh, process. Here's a, one of those mesial hooks that I talked about that a lot of those horses with a slight overbite form. Um, so reducing that because having those really impact their ability for that jaw to slide forward and slide back, um, which when they lay, raise and lower their head while they're eating, but also when you're asking for collection and things like that, when they're trying to collect and ha have that jaw slide appropriately, a lot of those hooks and ramps tend to cause problems with that too. So here's an example of a very significant overgrowth that we found on the initial exam. This is how it looked during or after that first treatment. And then after the second reduction, we were able to get it back. So a lot of times when we find those really overlong teeth like that, we may have to see them every three months until we can get them back to more of a normal occlusion. And then depending on why they're getting those overgrowths, so whether the tooth is missing below it or having those periodontal diseases, the horse may need to be seen every six months to just maintain that until the tooth doesn't erupt quite so fast anymore. So here's an example of some incisors. So that's a very significant distal hook. Again, that really impacts their ability to slide their jaw when you're asking for collection and things like that. So removing those hooks are important for them to be able to do their job. So here's a, a really lovely video that Dr. Rice put together that kind of summarizes our whole presentation here. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Rice doing an external exam on the horse. So the horse is sedated. We do everything with standing sedation. She's checking the bars. That's the area between the incisors and the cheek teeth where the bit lays. So sometimes they get some abrasions or uh, bone spurs and things like that formed there. She's checking lateral excursion. So the ability for the horse to slide its jaw side to side, which is what they would do when they're chewing. So we use an Aluma spec, so it's a, a pretty lightweight speculum, even though it looks pretty big. Dr. Rice is spoiled with her purple one there. Everybody's always jealous of that. Um, we make sure that the tongue isn't stuck, um, and then we make we rinse the mouth, getting rid of any of the food stuff that may be in there so we can get a good oral exam. We use dilute chlorhexidine, which has a little antimicrobial property. Uh, we keep that in our bucket to keep all of our instruments nice and clean, um, and so we're rinsing the mouth there. And then this is Dr. Rice doing her exam. So she's looking at every tooth and all the surrounding structures um, on a horse that has a nice, normal, healthy mouth, uh, especially one that we've seen every year. This part of the exam is usually pretty quick because um, we're looking for any changes or abnormalities. We keep records of all the horses that we see. So we kind of have an idea to see what, what disease pathology they had the last year. So we know to make sure we check that to make sure it's not progressing as in addition to seeing if there's anything new. So then getting into the floating. So 
what we do is we float off those sharp points on the cheek side of the upper teeth and then the tongue side of the lower teeth. Uh, so this is a, a power float um, or a powered instrument, I should say. Um, it has a spinning disc and this one has water and vacuum. This is the, the float that we use. It's called the flexi float. The, the beautiful thing about these power floats with the disc is that we can work on one specific spot. We can be very precise on what we're working on. So you can see that that tooth in the back there is pretty over long. So she was reducing that um, without having to do anything to the entire arcade. So being very particular and moving around, the the water is very nice because it keeps the tooth from becoming overheated um, and then the vacuum keeps it sucks all that dental material and and it helps us not inhale all that or drip a lot on our pants which is great in the winter because um, nobody wants to be wet in the middle of winter here in wisconsin so this is our finishing burr this is called the apple core uh, this is just kind of it's great for in the back where the tissue can be really tight so you can get along those teeth and make sure everything is nice and smooth. Um, you note here that she did not take all of these ridges. So that's a normal structure of the tooth. So that is needed to act as an auger to move the teeth, the food to the back of the mouth, as well as increasing the surface area for them to chew. What we do is when anything gets over long, so past what a normal position should be, that's when we really wanna make sure that that's being reduced. Um, this horse has a really nice mouth, so I think this was one that she usually does every year. Um, so again, finishing on the top teeth here, and then she'll just jump to lower teeth. So here we're on the lower teeth. Again, working between the, the, the tongue and the tooth is where they develop those sharp points. So she has her hand in there to stabilize the float and hold the tongue away to make sure she can see what she's doing. Um, so she's working on those those overlong areas and kind of smoothing that that uh, sharp point and making sure she doesn't change the, the angulation of the, the tooth or in anything like that. So we want to maintain the normal every normal architecture that we can and just taking away things that may be causing pathology. So she'll finish her flow here. I think there's a. And I believe this is posted on our Facebook if you wanted to watch it again. Um, but there's the before and after. So again, that overgrowth there that was reduced, all those sharp points were reduced. And then she's checking the incisors, making sure there's no hooks any, or anything on the incisors. And then she'll pull the cheek away and check that lateral excursion. So the ability for the teeth to slide appropriately and make sure nothing's catching or causing any uh, impingements on that. So I have to give credit to Dr. Rice for all the videos. She's very good at um, being able to work in the mouth while she has a camera in there. So in conclusion, having a yearly sedated oral exam is critical to being able to prevent a lot of these pathology. Um, sometimes with periodontal disease and things like that, we may want to shorten it to every six months, but it's a good idea to get them checked at least every year. Um, and then occlusal adjustments will help maintain the healthy mouth because when we get those overgrowths and those over length or teeth are getting over long when they're not supposed to, that causes other problems like the periodontal disease and then potentially risking of fracture and things like that. So that's everything I have. Is there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Hunt. I don't know how to stop sharing my screen. Great pictures. Oh, thank you. Let's see if I stop screen. Okay. I know that was a lot to go over. I tried to kind of do a brief overview, and if, if there was any questions, then we can go over that in a little bit more detail. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Hunt? Um, I guess another question that we normally get is when should be the first exam? Um, people usually wait until their horse goes into training, but we want to do at least an exam when they're uh, before about six months. To, we might not necessarily say them for it, but getting a good check. Um, and when they're losing all those caps and things like that is a good time to catch any of those malocclusions. Um, a lot of times we can catch things early and it corrects it. So if they have, if they're tending towards an overbite, 
um, we might be able to catch some of those problems and reduce it so they're not getting caught and that lets the, the lower jaw catch up with the upper jaw or vice versa. Um, so kind of earlier is key and then usually mid when they're doing well and they're kind of in their their mid-year we might be able to back down where we don't have to check them quite so often and then when you get an older horse that's important to check there too because we want to look for periodontal disease and mobility and things like that. So Dr. Hunt you mentioned that uh, horses have baby teeth just like we do. What happens if the baby teeth do not fall out? So they can cause um, problems when that happens, which is why we like to recommend checking them. Um, it may cause a tooth to be displaced. So if they have a baby tooth that they retain, the tooth that comes in behind it. So a lot of the times with the incisors, the incisors come on the tongue side. So it may get pushed out of line. And so then you get those malocclusions forming. Otherwise, in the cheek teeth, a lot of times they'll fracture and a piece of it will still remain. And then they get food gets stuck around it and things like that, um, and then you lead to periodontal disease. So making sure we get all those pieces removed appropriately keeps the mouth healthy. And I actually have a, I don't know if you can see here, I have a little skull. So this is what a baby is born with. So, well, this is actually a six week old foal. Unfortunately, it's kind of sad to think about, but they have those three cheek teeth. You can see the first adult tooth is starting to poke through. And then they have their incisors here. So all these teeth are the ones that are, are shed at various points of their life. So, which is nice because then we can age them based on what stage they are uh, in that shedding process up until probably about uh, two and a half, three, two, four. So we can be pretty confident in our aging up until 10. And then between 10 to 15, you can't really get quite, you might be able to be within that range. Um, and then when you get to be mid to late teens, they all kind of, you kind of, then you start to section it into different life stages. Um, but a combination of looking at their incisors and their cheek teeth, we usually can kind of give a good idea on, on how old they are. Which is where the saying, don't look a gift horse in the mouth comes from. Because <laughs> people are saying, oh, how old is this horse that I was given? <laughs> Very expensive would be the answer to that. <laughs> Is it the length of the incisors that tells you the age of the horse or? A combination of how long the incisor is and kind of the shape. Um, so a young horse will have a really short crown that's really wide. So it's more of a square shape versus a mid-age horse has um, kind of an equal distance, slightly and a slightly taller crown. Um, they start to get a little bit more triangle shaped when you look at the chewing surface. And then an old horse has a really long tooth um, and it has more of a like an oval appearance to the chewing surface. So depending on the, the tooth length and the shape, we can get an idea of how old they are. Um, but you can also look at the, the cheek teeth too. So taking a radiograph of the cheek teeth and just seeing how long the tooth is left in the head, you can estimate based on how old the tooth is too. Obviously these all change based on kind of their, their forage types. So if they're on a really rough sandy soil where they're wearing more tooth away, they may appear older in their dentition than a horse that's on really soft grass that doesn't wear as much tooth away every year. So there's obviously, variation there but for the most part we can get a good idea between the incisors and the, the cheek teeth. It, it seems that we're quick to extract a horse that has a, I'm probably not using the right term, but like an infection down around the, the bottom of the root or whatever where if in a human you would typically try some antibiotics or whatever with injections but do you do any of that with a horse or you just automatically if you see it you think it's just best to extract it? It depends on when we can check it. So if we catch something that's very early that just has a little bit of evidence of infection, a lot of times we'll try doing antibiotics on those first. Um, but it kind of depends on what the tooth looks like in the mouth or, and to why that, does, that process is happening. So most of the times there's been some trauma to the tooth where there's a fracture and there's no saving that unless you can do a full root canal. And it's very hard in a horse to do a true root canal because they have all those different pulp horns and then that pulp chamber in the bottom. So being all those areas clean can be very difficult. Um, but we do, if they do have the like early changes with their periodontal disease or 
if they the tooth looks fine in the mouth but they have a little apical infection we'll start them on antibiotics and do a course of antibiotics first to make sure to see if it calms down so we can try and save it unfortunately horses are stoic though so you don't catch them until they're usually pretty advanced versus when you have a tooth that hurts you you make it pretty obvious and you go to the dentist right away Civil root canal in a human, you can clean it whether mm -hmm. and fill that where a horse, it's not so easy. So if you can't clean it, then it's just going to complicate it and then you extract it. Exactly. Uh, we do perform event, um, some vital pulps or similar to a root canal on some incisors. Um, if we're able to catch a fractured incisor quite early, then we can save the tooth that way. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the problems is it's just time. We don't catch them early enough in the horse because they're uh, a prey animal, so they hide their pain, and we just don't catch things quite so early as we do in in dogs and in humans. So um, we do a lot more root canals and things like that in dogs, and that's also because they only have the the one root versus two root or three root versus the horses have those all those different individual pulp chambers, which makes it quite difficult. And the fact that we have to work in a tunnel with really long instruments makes it just harder to do it. And, and we do all of our procedures standing with local blocks. Um, so some horses just aren't amendable to the drill and, and having us work in their mouth and things like that. So it's all based on personality of the horse too, if they're a good candidate for those kind of procedures. Are you, are you worried about spacing? I mean, typically on a human, you know, if you extract a tooth, then you worry about the other tooth teeth spreading. Do you worry about that so much in a horse or? We do. Yeah, that is an unfortunate side effect of extracting a tooth. Um, they do have a lot of drifting. Um, so if a, a younger horse gets a tooth extracted, a lot of times they'll drift together to the point where you don't even know that that tooth was extracted. But then you have to be really cognizant on the upper teeth or the opposite quadrant to make sure that they're not getting over long because now they're short of tooth so that surface is shorter, um, which is why we get those overgrowths. But Unfortunately, it's one of those things that we, we run into um, that we have to do, decide what's best for the horse. Um, and some horses just have poor anatomy too. So they're designed to more like bookends where they, when they erupt into the mouth, they're slightly angled. So they should really be pressed together nice and tight, which is why you get that drifting um, when you pull one out. But every once in a while, you'll get a, t a horse that has poor anatomy where they're more like fence posts, so they're straight up and down. So then as the, the tooth erupts into the mouth, they're not getting that packing effect. So those horses are more prone to periodontal disease. And, and looking at local uh, people that do equine dentistry, I guess, you know, and float teeth or whatever, I'm assuming most of these people are like techs. They've been to some sort of school, but they're not at your level as far as it a veterinarian doctor is that true or is, or should you always take it to a veterinarian doctor or do you think for normal floating etc which is best i guess so we always want to have a veterinarian do your oral exam so the floating like i said is it's kind of like mowing the grass so if your, your horse has a normal mouth it just you take the sharp points off to increase comfort but getting in there and doing that oral exam is really the important part of having them checked um, and so you really need to have a, a veterinarian who can sedate the horse and do a good oral exam. Um, and I know it's not as popular in Wisconsin because there's some different rules where now veterinary, the floating and the occlusal adjustment and things like that is now under the, the umbrella of veterinary medicine. So you're supposed to be having a veterinarian at least oversee who's doing that care versus in some other states, I know it's more popular down south and I know in Illinois, it's not a rule yet either where they have what's called a lay dentist or a technician or someone who hasn't gone to veterinary school do that. Um, but it, there are, the general practitioner may not have quite as much, I mean, this is all we do here. So we, we are very advanced in all of our treatments and, and things like that. But the general practitioner has that basic knowledge and it's becoming more and more important in vet schools now than it was 10 years ago. Um, so they all learn how to do a good oral exam and, and doing some floats. And if there's going to be working on horses, they should really get good at that. And there's a lot of advanced education options for them to learn. Um, but a general practitioner is more, cap more than capable of doing all the floating and, and oral exams that we do. 
And then when they find those advanced things that they might not necessarily feel comfortable with being able to refer it to someone who can. We have a horse that we picked up probably like seven, eight years ago that had, she appeared to have no dental issues until we started trying to feed her antibiotics. And right away noticed she was dropping food and the vet that was watching her because she got injured right after we got her. So of course there was a lot of chaos. <laughs> we ended up doing every six months mm -hmm. with our, we have a specialist, a veterinary specialist up here that does dentistry every six months until this year, we finally graduated to an annual checkup with her. But I was just amazed at the work that they were able to do. It was like a full blown oral or yep. like orthodontal. Her whole entire mouth is different than when we picked her up. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunately there's a lot of things. We actually did a surgery surgery on a horse yesterday that came out of a uh, is a 16 year old quarter horse that came out of a, a sale pen, um, and it had horrible horrible dental. Um, it has that poor anatomy where the teeth come straight up, but since there wasn't any oral care, uh, we ended up having to extract six teeth because one, I put my hand in there and it came out in my hand. Like that should never happen. Um, but this poor horse is going to have to live on pellets. And that, the nice thing about what we have today is we have those options to be able to feed those horses that can't eat hay and things like that, um, that we can keep them going. But that oral exam is very important in being able to address the, the different problems and malocclusions um, and doing it every six months can be uh, a key to it that, you know, um, to get on top of those problems and then finally being able to graduate to every year. I know we have a lot of clients that are, do I get to be a year yet? And they're so excited and we're like, yes, he's finally, his mouth is healthy enough to finally be a year. And, um, but, and sometimes when they're young, they just need it every six months, especially if they're a performance horse. Uh, a lot of horses can be very sensitive to those sharp points. So the, the tooth is erupting in faster when they're younger. So they develop those sharp points faster. So just on a six month maintenance or six to nine month maintenance for some of those guys until they just slow down their eruption process a little bit. And then you can kind of drop it back to a year, sometimes a year and a half, um, depending on sometimes two years if they have a beautiful beautiful anatomy where they don't have any problems. But then again, when they get older, then you have to jump back up to at least every year, if not uh, twice a year, just to look for mobility and, and that periodontal disease and things like that. Because as the tooth erupts in the mouth and wears away, they taper. So those spaces are just prone to happen. And and when they run out of tooth, they, they get loose. And a loose tooth wailing around in there is uncomfortable so they usually uh once you get that out then they they start doing better but unfortunately when they get to be that age the teeth kind of start falling out like books so um you pull one and they fall like dominoes similar to having the the teeth drift and things like that so trying to that's why we get into the preventative medicine so we want to prevent all these things and keep the teeth in there as long as we can so it seems that Oop, you're muted. <laughs> I, I think you're asking a question, but you're you're muted, so I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. The uh, oh, sorry. I know a wolf tooth. If if they're ever discovered, it seems to me that's just seems like they just go ahead and pull them, just because it's probably going to cause an issue, whatever. Uh, with the canine teeth, do those cause any? Bridal issues typically, or do you worry too much about not the usually. canine? Yeah, not usually. Um, the those canine teeth sit farther forward, so they usually don't inhibit the the bit. Every once in a while, they may get some sharp points on the back of it, so we'll we'll float those down just to make it easier and less risky for the the owner to put the bit in and if the horse happens to jerk or something they don't get caught on that tooth um, but for the most part uh like you said we do pull a lot of wolf teeth um, a lot of people want them pulled because they don't want to wait to see if they turn into a problem um, if they have a very large wolf tooth like that one in the presentation those ones we usually don't extract because they usually don't have problems. They're tucked nice up and tight against the, the next tooth. So they're not gonna be inhibiting the, the bit or anything like that. Um, but if we're gonna extract them, they're always a lot easier to extract them when they're younger. Cause after that 
the process of where they're shedding those caps after that settles down, all the inflammation that happens um, in that process that causes those those wolf teeth to kind of scar into the bone. So then they become quite difficult to actually pull out. So um, a lot of people elect to do it when they're either getting castrated as a yearling um, or we do it right right after they shed that first premolar. Um, when they get to be that two year age stage, so two to two years, eight months, um, we usually have to be very careful. Um, we tend not to extract the wolf teeth at that point just because that developing adult tooth sits so closely to that wolf tooth that we don't want to risk damaging that developing tooth well um, before it has a chance to erupt into the mouth. So it's easier just to be like, let's just wait six months. We'll take it when we come back and check them in six months to make sure that that cap shed appropriately and we'll pull the tooth then if it's still there. And, and sometimes we benefit or we luck out where that that wolf tooth gets shed with that cap so then we don't have to even pull it. <laughs> I see a lot of people probably are not a, have a horse that's not as well trained and they put a very severe bit in the horse rather than train that horse do you and then you hear about a horse having you know a ruin in the horse's mouth is that causing issues with its teeth or is it just the the horse remembering those severe bits i guess that actually causes trauma to the bars so if you remember in the video with dr rice she stuck her thumb in the sides of the mouth and kind of ran it along the bars you know my bring my little head here. So the area between the incisors and the canine to that first tooth, so we call that the interdental space or the bar. So they'll get trauma here. So they can get little bone spurs and, and traumatize that. So a really harsh bit or someone who's really heavy handed. So it doesn't even necessarily have to be a harsh bit, but if you're really heavy handed, even in a soft bit, you can cause a lot of trauma to this area here. And then they get bumpy. So we call it roughening of the bar. So they get some essentially bone spurs that form there and then having that tissue rubbing up against those bone spurs can be quite irritating. Does that answer the question? Yeah and I'll quit with my dumb questions but thank you for oh, sharing. Oh no they're great. <laughs> they're great. No those are wonderful questions. Thank you so much. So Dr. Hunt how can we as clients um, make your job easier as far as preparing the area that you'll be using for the exam? Are there any things that we can have ready um, that you would need, you know, good leg, that kind of thing? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, so everybody is slightly different with how they have their setup, um, but the things that are really important for everybody is making sure that there's a nice safe environment to work in whether it's a stall or a wash rack um, a shed i we've worked in a garage before um, some place where there's there's nothing that the horse may stumble or, or back into or things like that um, so making sure that the environment itself is nice and safe because um, we do everything understanding sedation so we do sedate them um, having a place for them that's going to be nice and safe for them to recover from the sedation. Um, we really need power because our, our uh, floats are run by um, electricity and things like that. So having power available, um, having water available. If you don't necessarily have water in the barn or if it's really cold, having warm water is really nice because that keeps our mirror from fogging up. Um, or if you want, a lot of people have the sheath cleaned at the same time because the horse is sedated and might as well get the bang for your buck with the sedation. Um, so having nice warm water available for that as well. Um, lighting wise, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, it's actually easier to work in a darker environment. So somewhere that's out of the direct sunlight, um, just because we have our own headlight. Um, a lot of vets will have a speculum light where they put it on the speculum, but we usually have our own light source that shines into the mouth. So having kind of more of a lower ambient light is actually helpful. Um, so if we don't necessarily have to work under outside in the bright sun, that sometimes is a little bit harder, but if that's the only spot that you get to work, you, you have to make it work. Um, but mostly just having a nice safe environment for the horse to be is, is the biggest thing. Yeah, I had a Percheron gelding, and he was such a lightweight when it came to sedation. It was always quite funny for us when it was time those, for his dental. Those draft horses, they tend to be lighter. You, would, you wouldn't think, um, but a lot of times I can float a draft horse on the same amount that I give my Welsh pony. She's, she's kind of naughty, though, so <laughs> she gets so worked <laughs> up about it. Um, 
but it's, it's all breed specific too. So, so draft horses and Tennessee walkers, they tend to be more of a lightweight um, versus the, the warm bloods and the thoroughbreds uh, tend to be a little bit more difficult. Um, the ones that are usually the, the bad actors or the ones that take a lot of drugs tend to be the paints and the Appaloosas. Um, for some reason, the, the spotted horses tend to be more resistant to the drugs, so they tend to need more drugs. Um, I hope I don't offend anybody with the Appaloosa slash paint joke, but we always joke that they have spots on their brain. So that's why the, because they have spots on their body, they have spots on the brain and that's why the sedation doesn't work quite as well. Um, but just things like that. And, and we always keep record of all the horses that we do. So we know um, from visit to visit what kind of sedation or how they react to the sedation. Um, if it's a new patient, uh, we always start on the lighter side because you can always add more um, versus going over and just giving them a big heavy dose um, but because we want them to be sedate enough that they don't mind us working in their mouth but not so sedate that they're uh, kind of buckling their knees and weaving around a lot um, but that's also where our stocks come in handy so the older horses can be tricky to sedate because their body gets really drunk but their head doesn't um, so they're still fighting you in in the mouth but their their body is really kind of listing around or buckling their knees. Um, so being able to put them in our portable stocks kind of gives them something to prop their hip up against and then they don't feel like they're, they have better footing and things like that. Um, so they tend to sedate a little bit easier when they have that comfort where they're not thinking, oh gosh, I'm gonna fall down. Um, another difference is we we work in, in, this, uh, in a chair in front of them. Um, a lot of people stand and some horses, you have to stand because they're large and, um, but we always try to keep more of a a neutral head position and neck mostly because it's safe for their head but also if you keep your eye their eyes pointing forward instead of looking up they tend to stand a little bit better they don't seem like they get quite as dizzy from the sedation so they're not um, buckling their knees or, or, or falling down quite as much so just a Interesting. little so that's why we sit in a chair working in front of them um, just to kind of keep that neutral head position and it's easier on us too we don't have to do long squats and lunges all day long. <laughs> so I have seen um, my vet used a mechanism that she went over a rafter that sort mm -hmm. of held his head up. Yep. Um, but then uh, another vet at a different barn used, it was almost like a tripod that held the jaw. Can you talk about the difference in the equipment? Oh, of course. So there's many different ways um, to have the head be held. And, and I'm lucky enough where I always have an assistant, someone to help hold the head on a headstand for me. Not everybody is quite that lucky. So there's different, there's dental halters or um, a dental ring, which they throw over the rafter or over the stall door. And then that holds the head up versus the, the headstand, like the one we have, where it's more of a platform um, or a tripod. There's all just different kinds of, of what works best for each veterinarian and what they have the ability to do um, or what kind of space that they have. So a dental halter takes up less space. So if they're doing general practice and they just have, uh, you know, their, their vet truck or um, like a, a Subaru or something like that, um, they have limited space. So they might not necessarily be able to have the big headstand. So having something that they can hook over the rafter works better for them and it's more safe or space saving and things like that. So it all goes on, on what the, the vet is used to and what and works for well for their, how they practice. Okay, yeah, it was just, it was interesting. He seemed to prefer the halter versus the stand. And I wondered if it had anything to do with um, maybe the vibrations as the float was going on. I don't know if there's I, a lot of vibrations. Um, I usually don't. So sometimes they can be a little reactive to the, the vibration and the noise. Um, but if your horse is sedated well enough, they usually don't react unless there's a painful tooth. Um, but again, that's all based on on owners or the the practitioner's preference. Mm -hmm. um, I find that I I like the headstand better because the head is more stabilized versus when I have one suspended. Because um, every once in a while, like when you have to work on a mini or something like that, we do have like a cut down stocks for the minis um, so that you can work a little bit lower. But every once in a while, you'll get that horse that just doesn't fit on um, the height of headstand. So then our, our assistant is holding them. But then the head just seems like it's moving around a little bit more and it's not quite as stable. Um, 
and my preference for the headstand is it, it keeps their head a little bit more neutral versus when you do like a dental halter or a ring they can kind of invert their neck a little bit easier just because their head is being held in that one position um, and that their chin can tip up a little bit easier versus when you have a flat headstand it, it kind of holds their chin position a little bit better um, but that's that's my preference. I I just struggle a little bit more with with the headstand and and I don't like when when it's tied to something that if that horse were to pull back or or stumble forward, um, they're attached to the building versus the headstand can get knocked out of the way. Um, but again, it's all based on what the vet is used to and what they like. I don't think one way is better than another. It's it's everything is better and certain like I'm sure that's probably safer in his hands versus mm -hmm. the headstand is safer in my hands so yeah it was just it was interesting to have the vet say he was a little harder to examine with one piece of equipment versus easier on the other and it's you know they have preferences just like we do yep you you use what you're used to essentially so it's always it's always hard to to learn something new but um that was my favorite part of being a student when I'd go and ride along with different vets and you see all these different ways of doing it and you kind of make a way that works well for you and works well for your hands. And, and some people, like I said, some people don't have the luxury of having a, a technician who can go with them or an assistant to go with them. So they have to rely on potentially having the owner and, and different ways that, that they can, you know, keep the owner safe and keep themselves safe and things like that. They have to, to work in the, within those confines. So. So what is the most unusual situation you have encountered so far in all of your ride-alongs and in your residency and maybe um, in the classroom example? For like most unusual place that I've had to work or things like that? Uh, most unusual place you've had to work, but most unusual condi dental condition, I guess. Um, oh gosh. <sighs> My probably most unusual one um, that sticks out in my head, well, I have two. So one was we have the cart, and so we need to be able to have electricity and be able to get back to the barn. So um, I was with Dr. Rice, so I had just started. Um, so I was kind of doing a little bit of a, a mini internship to make sure that this for sure was what I wanted to do the rest of my life before I got totally involved with doing the residency. Um, but it was, of course, a, a snowy winter day, and we pull in, and, and the barn is back behind the house, and there's no path besides like this little walking path that she walked from her back door to go feed her horses. And so we're like, there's no way we're going to get the cart back there. There was like two in, like two feet of snow on either side of the path. And we're just like, oh my gosh. Well, then we asked, we're like, so is your garage empty? Can we work in your garage? And she's like, of course. So she backed her car out and we pulled our stocks in and we unloaded our stocks and put the horse in and we were working in the garage. It was nice because she had a heated garage. So that was, that was lovely. Um, but we were working next to their boat in between their boat and their four wheeler. <laughs> And thankfully, the horse was really good that it didn't really care that once we got it sedated and put it in the garage, that we were able to close the garage door so it stayed nice and warm because that was um, unfortunately a horse that had quite a bit of periodontal disease. So it was it was quite a, a long visit. So being able to work in a nice, comfy, warm environment was nice. Um, my other most memorable one was when I was out on a call on my own. It was this tiny little um shed which is perfectly fine um but the the owner didn't believe in mouse traps and she had all these mice running around and i had to do a horse and a mini donkey and a mini and so the minis i was sitting on the and i, I could just see out of the corner of my eye all these little mice running around she's like oh yeah you know they they share the food with the horses so the horse would have to put their nose in and like bump the mice out of the way so she had like domesticated mice and i was sitting and float sitting on the ground floating this mini and this mouse ran across my shoe and almost up my pant leg and i was like oh my gosh <laughs> good thing i'm not too squarely around mice but um, oh my word thankfully the assistant that i had with me that day she doesn't mind mice either but the other assistant and our barn manager that we have here mario he is terrified of mice so if that was oh a God. call because he usually goes with me on a lot of those calls so if it would happen to be a day that he went with me he would have been like nope we're out of here <laughs> <laughs> i am sitting in the truck 
<laughs> probably the most unusual was that one and that one was a little bit hard because we had to um, really maneuver our way through all these really narrow passages to get back into the little shed um, there wasn't a good uh, way to get into the the running part of the shed that we worked in um, so between that and, and the, the little friends that I had running over my shoes while I was working was was quite the unusual experience <laughs> oh my goodness so what is um, maybe the most dramatic improvement you've seen in a horse that you've worked on or someone in the practice has worked on? Pretty much any periodontal disease case that we have. So we get a horse that is is quitting, so chewing up those hay balls and spitting them out, um, losing weight, things like that. Just doesn't seem like he, he has an appetite he wants to eat, but he chews it up and spits it out and um, we get in there and it's one of those what we call a peak and shriek where you open the mouth and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this? There's all these spaces that are full of food and teeth that are out of whack and, and things like that. And, and a lot of times, unfortunately, those horses are quite difficult to work on because their mouths are so painful. But once we start doing some of that periodontal treatment and getting all that stuff calmed down, they start eating better instantly. And that's my favorite part of being in dentistry is that you can make some of those adjustments or pull out a sore tooth or things like that. And all of a sudden, as soon as they wake up from sedation, they're eating perfect or eating a hundred times better. And then they blossom and they put a lot of weight back on. And the best part is that owners can see that change and they appreciate that change. And, and you're making that horse better and you're improving their quality of life versus, um, you know, if you do a uh, uh, annual vaccine appointment, which is also equally as important because you want to prevent those diseases, but you're like, yep, I did the shots. And you're like, all right, cool. Like you don't necessarily see, you don't get to see that benefit or see that change as you do when you make a good correction or you, you do, you treat a lot of that dental pain. Um, the, the horses just turn around and do so much better. That is fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Does anyone have any other questions or stories or comments? Okay. Well, given that we had some technical challenges this morning, um, I will be sure to post Dr. Hunt's contact information in the Facebook event. So yes. you all are welcome to contact her if you have any further questions or maybe you your horse is kind of getting to that age where they might need a dental specialist and want to contact them if you're in the area. Thank you so very much, Dr. Hunt. This has been absolutely fascinating. It was great ha being had and thank you for inviting me and letting me uh, spew on my favorite subject. So <laughs> Wonderful. And if we want to learn any more about this, um, do you have a favorite website or resource or something that you would recommend to follow? Um, well, we have quite a bit of information on our website. Um, so we go into the different components of the, the oral exam, and we try to have a lot of educational stuff on our website as well. Um, but other than that, pretty much any um, veterinary website that um, has some information. The horse has a lot of really good information. Actually, there was a, a really, really good, um, let me go grab a copy of it. I'll be right back. Great. So yes, this month is actually Equine Dental Awareness Month, which is why we chose to ask Dr. Hunt to speak on this this month. And our series will continue next month we are confirming our speaker. So it will either be basic hoof care or as March is Equine Nutrition Month, it may be a topic on nutrition. So please do follow us on Facebook. We have all of these seminars posted on, under our events for the Hooved Animal Humane Society. And just a reminder for anyone local, Tomorrow, our tax shop is open from 10 until 2, and we're also doing farm tours on the hour. So 11, noon, and 1 p.m., we will have farm tours. Dr. Hunt, please. Awesome. So this actually is Equus. Um, I believe it's from the same people who make the horse, um, but they put one out every season, essentially. So this is the, the winter edition of 2021. 
Um, but it has a really, really, really good summary in here on, on horse dentistry. And it has really good graphics and pictures. Um, and just a lot of really, really good information in here. And so um, if you wanted to look up one particular thing to get some more information, um, the equusmagazine.com, looking up for the winter 2021 or issue was very good. So. Wonderful. We'll find that link and make sure we put it out there. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us and, and battling with us through the technical challenges. And we hope we will see you again next month. Thank you so much. Have a great day, guys. Everybody Thank stay you. warm if you're north. <laughs> <laughs>